Women to Watch is an intimate look into the lives of prominent and influential women leaders from around the world and the challenges they faced on their journey. It's the real story behind her title. Join us every week to hear more stories about women from around the world and in your own communities at womentowatch.net. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. For the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another week of Women to Watch. I'm Sue Rocco. So great to be here, and I'm very, very excited and honored uh, to have a guest with me this week. Joining us from beautiful, sunny California uh, will be Dr. Kristen Willemeyer. And Dr. Willemeyer is a neuroscientist and an author. So we're going to be talking about her um, fascinating work and her most recent book as well. As always, stay with us during the breaks where you'll hear from our exclusive watch team of on-air contributors, bringing you news and information from their industries and their organizations. And for all things Women to Watch, you can always visit our website at womentowatch.net. That's women, the number two, watch.net, N-E-T. Um, and see our lineup, which we have some incredible women coming on the show. So now I'm very excited and to honored to welcome to the show, Dr. Will Meyer. Hi there, Hi. Sue. How are you? I'm terrific. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here. And thank you for the honor of oh. being a participant in this extraordinary program that you have. Truly, I'm, I'm honored that you reached oh, out to I me. I appreciate that so much. And really, you know, your life story and the work that you're doing is incredibly important, especially today. Um, and very fascinating to me. I think I shared with you when we met how much I am, you know, interested in exploring, you know, everything about um, neuroscience in particular, mm -hmm. psychology, just the workings of people in the brain um, is so interesting. I know. I love, I love that when you and I had our initial meeting, I could tell you are truly somebody who is passionate about understanding the brain, the workings of the mind. And for somebody like me, it's really fun to have a dialogue with somebody that's that engaged and, and excited about the brain. Yeah. I don't know how people are in actually, I think, <laughs> you know, well, I'll, I'll tell you, when I got into this career 25 years ago, nobody was really talking about the brain. There weren't, people didn't know who neuroscientists were. It wasn't as common as it is today. So it's actually wonderful to see, you know, that my field is so, I guess it's within the public consciousness, right? People yes. understand what neuroscience is. Yes. Um, I, people used to ask me what I did for a living and I would say I'm a neuroscientist and people thought that I said I was a nurse. It, it was, oh, it was really fascinating to me. I'm like, wow, no, I'm, 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 I'm a brain scientist. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. We've um, come a long way. Yes, we have. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the discoveries and the innovations around it, you know, what were not we, Learning you about the brain. and your colleagues are uncovering, I think is, is just incredible. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit about that later in the show, but I want to start with, I, I loved reading about your personal bio. I could, <laughs> I could see you as a little girl um, doing the things you were doing mm -hmm. growing up and outside. And my first question for you was um, your mom's choice to send you to a Montessori school. Mm -hmm. um, tell me how that, her, her decision to do that um, affected your very beginning and how you learned. Yeah, I, I love that. So my mom was a teacher. Um, that was her, one of her initial careers. She was an art history teacher and a math teacher. So she placed high value on education. But um, with the Montessori school system, you know, for people who are not familiar, it's really um, self-focused learning and self-motivated learning. And being in that environment, you got to choose what you wanted to do on any given day. And so she started me in their program at age one year, uh, one year old, and I stayed there until I was six. So I had this wonderful 
opportunity to just be creative and do the things that really inspired me instead of being in a more structured classroom setting. And the reason why I bring this up, and I think it was so instrumental in who I've become today, is because as a neuroscientist, you know, and anybody who actually goes into a, a PhD profession, it's very much self-directed, self-motivated learning. Right, you're you're learning for the sake of curiosity, and I feel like in those very early stages in development, if you allow a young child to really explore what their passions are mm -hmm. in an environment where there's learning, but it isn't sort of a forced learning, which is what you get when you're in a more structured classroom, right? First, second, third grade, and I actually had a very challenging transition going from the Montessori school environment to that traditional school classroom yeah. where they told you what to do, when to do it. And I actually, I bucked the system. I, I actually didn't do things. You know, I, I stopped. I almost like challenged authority. So, you know, when looking at the trajectory of my life and seeing how did I actually become a neuroscientist? This wasn't the career that I thought I would be in. When I really look at the path that I took and how I was guided by my parents, I can now see why I ended up being this very sort of independent thinker, and going to do a PhD and doing things that are a little, what I would call non-traditional. Yes. You know, it's it's interesting to me that it's taken so long for society to understand how much sense it makes to allow children, students to study what they're interested in. Their passion, you know, their heart. Their passion. Yes. You, young kids will naturally gravitate to the things that they are going to excel in. Yes. And so if you provide that opportunity for them to do that at these very young ages when the brain is in this extraordinary period of growth. You know, right. many people know that if you expose children, young children to a variety of foreign languages, they pick them up very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. So if you yes. do this, you know, yes. if you're raised in a house where people are speaking English, but you have a nanny that speaks French or Italian or Spanish, the child can pick up both languages because the the brain is so plastic and it's learning. So I feel like if parents really capitalize on this extraordinary time for children to learn and grow, and they are, I mean, most, you know, most parents put kids in pre-K and then kindergarten and then, you know, traditional school. But um, I guess I'm here making a pitch for Montessori schools because yeah. I really do feel like it was instrumental in me becoming a scientist. Yeah. I do. And, and I would imagine, you know, it wakes the kids up in the classroom to be. You, it fosters a love of learning. Yes. Right. So can you imagine instead of being dropped off at a school and you're having to be in the structured program and we're not going to love everything. You're not going to love every subject that you take. That's why Montessori allows you to just gravitate towards the things that you love, whether that be art or whether that be math. And apparently I loved sorting things and I would sit in corners and build and sort blocks and put them into organized patterns. And oh. my father, <laughs> you know, Montes apparently Montessori school isn't exactly inexpensive. And so my father um, used to tell my mom, because he'd ask me what I'd learned in school. And I would always say, I would say sorting. Apparently I would say like at sorting. And it was every day I would come back and say that. And my father was like, what are we paying all this money for, for her to sit in a corner and sort things? And I was probably, you know, that's very analytical and trying to understand and organize things into structured patterns. So right. yes. um, again, you know, I'm 50 years old. I can now, in retrospect, look at my life and the career and sort of the the path that I've taken to get here and go, yes, I feel like Montessori was actually instrumental in leading me towards more of a, again, a, a career and uh, a PhD, right? A degree in philosophy, which is actually philosophers question things. Yes. We ask things. We just were curious about life and the world. Yes. So.
Yeah. Um, well, you were also, you definitely were an explorer at a young age and you, you know, you were an outdoors girl, you were outside playing, you were apparently bringing in little critters from the outside. I was learning from critters, you were bringing them in and, you know, studying their, their tiny little workings. Um, and <laughs> I wonder, how did your parents support that? In what way were they you know, again, allowing you kind of in that same philosophy of the Montessori school, allowing you to explore the things that you were most curious about. Yes, yeah, so that was really fascinating. Um, well, one rule that we had in the house was no watching television. So whenever I came home from school, if I didn't have a sport or something structured going on, um, I was always encouraged to be doing something productive. I wasn't allowed to watch television, um, which I also think is very instrumental again in who I've become today because that time that could have been spent sitting in front of a TV, I was in the basement. My father had one of those old fashioned microscope sets, one of the kits. I can literally see it in my head. It looks like it's from like the Mad Men era, like just really old school little microscope. And it had the slides that had the bugs on them and you could look at them under the microscope. So I, I was very young at this age, but I would go out into our yard and just pick up birds, like dead birds. I mean, just things that I oh could God. bring down into the basement to look at under the microscope. And my wow. mom was horrified. She's like, what are you doing? It's a little kid. You don't know. I mean, you just see this little bird, you know, or, or something that I'd find in the yard and I bring it down in the basement, look at it under the microscope. Again, I love that. this is that what I would really like highlight to parents, just watch what your kids do. Because again, this was early. I'm talking five, six, seven, eight years old. Again, I, at that time, I had no idea I would end up being a scientist. Really. I, I still, my career path, I had dreams of doing other things, but look, these, you know, these were manifesting and showing themselves right. these behaviors that I, I had that I, I love the natural curiosity. Yeah. I think it's hard for parents, you know, to not interject and, but real truly the best thing is to just let them be and observe unless yeah. they're going to hurt themselves. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. That that's how they, they find their passion and, and that's how the people around them uncover what it is, which is always good to know. Well, a, f a fun thing, you'll love this too. The other thing I used to do in the basement, besides looking, you know, under a microscope at things, I used to teach, pretend to teach classes downstairs in my basement. And my girlfriend and I, there was a show in Chicago, um, a very famous radio uh, DJ named Larry Lujak had a show um, and he had a radio show. He had this segment called Animal Stories. And so my next door neighbor and I would get a little tape recorder and we'd go down in the basement and record radio shows together, just oh, like wow. what you and I are doing now. So again, I look back as a kid, I was like, oh my God, I did that. My mom has the lost tapes. She calls them the lost. <laughs> <laughs> she always said she was going to play them at my wedding. Like when I... <laughs> It's pretending to be Larry Lujak. Um, oh my thankfully, gosh, that's the best. That thankfully, the she best. passed away before I had my wedding. Oh to my have those things oh crop up, but you know, yeah. you gotta love parents, right? For oh, saving I think it's all such those. a gift to be able to look back and see ourselves as little <laughs> little people. You know, <laughs> right? That's what we were doing, who we were. It really yeah. does. Um, well, I want to talk about your equestrian um, mm -hmm. riding, and and so you know, first of all, I think. That also takes courage and confidence to get up on a horse, not only to get up yeah. on a horse, but to compete at that level. How were you first introduced to that? So um, as I had mentioned to you in my pre-interview questions, so my parents had me involved in all sorts of sporting activities, you know, from gymnastics, to softball, to tennis. And every summer I would go to what's called a Kelly's camp. So they had a Kelly's gymnastics camp and a Kelly's tennis camp. So I think I was six years old and they sent me to Kelly's riding camp and I fell in love with the horses. And it was fortuitous because our next door neighbor, so I grew up in a suburb of Chicago um, and it was a horse 
area. I mean, people around me had horses and stables. So my next door neighbor um, had horses, they had ponies. And because I found this love of riding, one day um, they took me to the barn, which was our day farm, the barn that I ended up showing and riding with. And uh, I went and rode over there and it was like I was hooked. So it went from Kelly's riding camp to finding a barn that was, it wasn't actually close to our home. It was a 45 minute commute, um, but a barn that, you know, would welcome me in. And, you know, I started riding the ponies and the horses and all of a sudden it became, I would say a thing. It actually became something I did every single day. My family got me a horse for my seventh birthday and I just, I rode from age seven all the way up until 17. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, what was the horse's name? My first horse was Strawberry. So she was okay. a quarter horse and she happened to become pregnant. So when she had her babies, we decided to um, sell her and let her be with her babies like out in the field. And I got my second horse, Razzmatazz, who was a Welsh pony. So he was a large Welsh pony. And I used to show him in the children's adults jumpers so you know for people who are familiar with the equestrian world there's hunters and there's jumpers and the hunters is when you go through a course and you're judged based on how well you take that horse around the course so it's judged on the horse and how beautifully you know he jumps over the fences Whereas the jumpers, it doesn't have the politics. It's just you jump over a course as quickly as possible. So it's all about clearing a hurdle and doing it as quickly as possible. Um, and I really had a fondness for the jumpers. And you start jumping fences that are three foot six, four foot, four foot three, five foot in height. And those are very large fences. Yeah. So when you're you know, I was a very young um, rider showing horses over three foot nine, four foot three inch fences. You know, I'm, I'm you know, you're what this seven, eight, you're not very tall. So some of these fences were like as big as I was. Yes, right. And I found um, I found training and showing and show jumping such a thrill, such a joy. I mean, I just the connection with the horse, the skill it takes mm. to get a horse over a fence. And anybody who's ridden, um, if, you, if you're riding a horse and you get them to a fence and you get them to a bad distance so they can't get over it clearly, um, they'll stop, they'll turn on their haunches and run the other way. So you start to have to learn the skill of being able to get them um, over a fence properly so that they don't stop. And so there's all kinds of... Um, I just think skills that I started to learn and pick up at a very young age, showing and riding. And the, in our house, my mom said, if I wanted to ride horses, I had to get straight A's in school. Oh, so wow. my parents are very smart. They used my sport as a way to also inspire me to stay on top of my studies um, because, you know, you can go to the barn and ride every day, but if my grades slipped, I wasn't going to be able to continue. So I actually thought that was actually a really smart parenting strategy. Right. Not only that, that keep you're you're um you're in school and then after school you're engaged in in you know at the barn every day. The farm every day keeps you every out of day. trouble. Right. It kept it, I will tell you when you talk about trouble. So, you know, I started showing at age seven and when I was a senior in high school, I had mentioned this to you, one of our horses got sent to Texas for another trainer to try and we were going to do a trade. And, you know, I didn't get my horse back for well over a year and a half. So I was actually out of showing. And um, like most teenagers, right, you're in, it's your senior year in high school and you're having fun, you're going to parties. And all of a sudden I lived that other life that I'd actually missed. I wasn't out doing that sort of socializing. And, you know, in retrospect, I'm glad that I had that opportunity to do so um, because I think as an athlete, and I was, you know, I was really training with aspirations to become a professional equestrian, potentially an Olympic hopeful, like probably many of us who, who show, you know, if you're with, people who are already in the Olympics and you're training with people at that level, you certainly think you have an opportunity to get there. So that was my goal. 
you know, every day I was at the barn, every weekend there was a horror show. So it really consumed my life. So to have that all go away my senior year of high school, it was, it was quite a pivot. Um, and I had to sort of refocus my whole life. Right. And, and also I think one of the most impactful things, um, that's happened to you in your life was an accident, right? <sighs> Right, right. So that that's true. When I was um, 14, I was actually at a horse show in the show ring and they had uh, they had just watered it down. So the corners were a little slippery and I was riding in one of the jumper classes. So remember, I, when you ride as a jumper, it's really how quickly you can get over the fences and it's a speed class. So you're taking horses you know, and, and running at fences and taking them at crazy angles and they're spinning on their haunches. So my horse, this one was on razzmatazz. He slipped. I flipped over his head. He scrambled to get up. He stepped on my chest and my ribs punctured my lungs and caused oh my what's called hemoneumothorax. So after it happened, I'm very fortunate he didn't step on my face um, because I was underneath him. So he stepped sort of right here on my chest. Wow. I had popped back up right in the show and people couldn't believe it. They saw it. Then they saw me get up and then took me right to the ambulance. And when I got into the ambulance is when um, I became unconscious. Oh my gosh. So were I went, I, parents there? Did they my parents were there. Okay, yep. They took me to the hospital and um, my, one of my lungs was filling up with blood. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, interestingly enough, you know, it took, sort of several years for my breath to become normal again. So I sometimes would have labor breathing. I could hear it, um, but I was not deterred. You know, I was not, I, I still rode and showed horses. You got so, back on the horse that, you know, the phrase about getting back on the horse. You yeah. literally did that. That's I literally got back that's on the horse. <laughs> well, that yeah. was, you know, my trainer, Alex Jane, who I love, he's extraordinary, you know, fifth generation horseman. And, and as I mentioned to you, his son is on the U.S. Olympic team. So I've trained yes. with these really extraordinary athletes. And Alex sort of had a motto when we were training in the show ring, not even the show ring, I'm just sorry, in the um, just a regular training session. If I fell off in the ring, you just get right back up, back up and get on the horse and get him over the fence, right? You always get up and go. So it's very much a warrior mentality. And I just had that, you know, and I think as kids, you know, you'll see a lot of kids who play sports and get hurt. They just get right back up, hmm. right? You know, they yes. just get the competitive, the truly competitive ones. Right? Yeah, that are, it's that competitive spirit, you know, yes. I, it's probably the adrenaline right and and the drive to like get back up and do it again right so i yeah i mean it really goes to show i learned to be um focused and driven and determined and you know undeterred you know yes. you fall off you get right back up again yeah tell me about tell me about the moment that you decided um that you were going to leave equestrian riding behind and pursue <sighs> a degree in science. Well, I will tell you, I, I feel like it was done for me. So when we, so I had the show horse Lexington that we um, had sent to Texas to be sold in a trade. And um, there was a horse that I wanted, Roman Lear. So I thought my senior year of high school that that trade was going to happen and I would continue showing. And Unfortunately, you know, my horse did not come back for another two years and my parents were not about to get me another horse. You know, they're extremely expensive. And um, so that decision was sort of made for me. You know, I, okay. if I wanted to ride, I was still going to the barn and riding, but I didn't have my own horse and I wasn't showing. And so I knew that I had to... Um, pursue other interests that I wasn't going to be able to take a horse to college. Like some people do to be able to continue riding and showing. Oh, wow. Cause that's oh, so those particular schools. Yeah. There's some, yeah. there are schools that have uh, riding programs. So I wanted to continue. And then when I finished, I wanted to actually be a professional equestrian and continue showing. So what I decided to do was study psychology. I wanted to understand 
the mind, but I wanted to apply it to athletics. So I wanted to work with elite athletes who are in competitive situations. And how do you train the mindset, you know, to be successful? And I had been successful. I mean, again, I had been coached by one of the best in the business for, you know, a decade. So I wanted to learn how the brain works how do you do this with people? So I think my initial goal was I'm going to become a sports psychologist. And okay, that turned into so much more, right? Sports right. psychology turned into wanting to understand the organic functioning of the brain, the physiology of the brain, not just sort of a theoretical perspective, which a lot of times is what we study in psychology and cognitive psychology. I actually wanted to understand the brain, the inner workings of the brain, the neurobiology, the physiology. So um, as an organ, would you say, would you say yeah, as an organ? organ. Yes. So it's, it's, it was taking it beyond um, teaching people sort of the psychology of the brain, right? And how we think and behave to actually understand the actual physical structure of the brain, to dissect it, to look at it at the level of the single cell. How do the neurons communicate with one another? How does that lead to thought, movement, behavior? How does that cause degenerative diseases, right? What, you know, so my, my love started to expand into wanting to understand how to treat diseases that we think are incurable, like Alzheimer's, like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's yeah. and brain tumors. And mm -hmm. so... Um, I think it was that natural inquisitive mind. I wanted to go deeper than psychology, you know? So I, I went from high school where, okay, you know, course is gone. I've got to now focus on what is my career going to be. I go off to Boston college, really start to take a deep dive into psychology and cognitive psychology and, um, you know, understanding the human mind. And then from there, you know, actually from there, I wanted to go into medicine and be a traditional MD. I happened to be dating somebody at the time who uh, went to Harvard uh, undergrad and Harvard Medical School. And he also happened to be a consulting physician for the New England Patriots. And he was the one that actually changed my mind from going into medical school to pursuing a uh, graduate degree, either in science or neuroscience or physiological science. So, um, you know, I went from, again, wanting to work with patients to then wanting to understand the brain. And actually, I love both. I mean, what I do today is both. It is both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, listen, we're going to go into our first break. Okay. When we come back, I really want to dig in more to the work that you're doing. Uh, stay with us for our watch team, and we'll be right back with Dr. Kristen Willemeyer. At Action News, we cherish every moment, and it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world. Never miss a moment. Trust the people at Action News. And welcome back to the show. I'm joined this week by Dr. Kristen Willemeyer. And Kristen is a neuroscientist, and she is also the author uh, of a book called Biohack Your Brain, um, How to Boost Cognitive Health. And, and we'll talk about that as well later in the show. Um, one of the things, Kristen, I really wanted to talk about was your experience um, while you were at Boston College working at a prison facility. And... I can't imagine, you know, well, I should say, knowing you, you probably weren't afraid. <laughs> you were you were curious, you were gonna go in and do it. But what having met inmates like that, mm -hmm. um, working with them, what surprised you the most? 
Okay, well, so I should correct that. I I went so at Boston College, they it's a Jesuit school, and they're really connected to um, the community and making sure the students that attend um, are connected with their communities. It's very service oriented. So there was a program they had called Person and Social Responsibility, and within that program, you know, you could select where you wanted to spend a year serving. And so I chose their prison fellowship program, which you had to get accepted into. And I believe there were five or six of us. And every week we would go to either the Bay State Correctional Facility or Concord Farm. So these are men's um, medium and minimum security prisons of Boston. And the goal was uh, to be able to connect with the inmates. Uh, I actually had to run a group and it gave them an opportunity for inmates who actually had good time um, to be able to connect with people in the outside world. So I would go and discuss events that were happening in the news and just have really connected dialogues with them. And then you had opportunities afterwards to connect with them one-on-one. -on -one. And while they weren't really supposed to be sharing why they were in there, when you go for a year, I mean, I went every Wednesday to one location or the other um, with the other people in the program, and you start to get to know people. And, yeah. you know, the minimum security prison, um, those inmates were actually transitioning to being out into the real world. So it was really fascinating to see people Again, a medium security prison, they're in there for a considerable period of time and they're in there for white collar crimes, drug issues, um, you know, people harm <laughs> other people. I mean, there were some pretty intense um, interactions, but you know what I learned and what I love about that experience? Number one, I wasn't afraid. I was really curious. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to understand why they were there, what their backgrounds were. I saw the humanity in each person. And I also understood there was a mental health component there, which mm -hmm. I think was really fascinating, too, you know, because if we're not connected with people who are you know incarcerated everybody is a human being right everybody should have the chance at redemption um everybody should have the chance to learn and to connect with others i mean you can you know people do bad things all the time and sometimes we have prisons for a reason right if if somebody's got a mental health issue or they're schizophrenic and they're going to be a harm to others we need to have that space where they're away from you know, people in society, but they still deserve to connect with other people, right? Like myself. Oh, so the story is what you, you want to know what happened, what led you to this place, right? What your, led your, you to this place? You know, yes. was it your upbringing? Why did you do it? How are you, you know, how are you becoming reformed? Right. And yes. in Boston college actually has a program now where they're going into prisons and educating um, the inmates and helping them to provide that education so they can then go out and hold a job. So it was such a fascinating experience. And then at the end of the program, we hold a prison fellowship week on campus where we talk about our experiences there. And I wish I actually had to keep a journal when I, when I was there and I would love to find those because it's been so long. My God, it's been 30 years since I did that wow. program. But wow. what it did for me was I also wanted to understand the mind more like I want to understand the inner workings of the mind and what causes somebody to do something. What causes somebody to murder another human being? What 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 is going on in the brain? Yeah. To do that yes. um, you know, certainly there's the, the portion of the population that has mental health challenges. There's other people who do these things um, willingly, right? They're they're very sort of conscientious about it, and then. There's other people, I mean, you know, what I've learned from working in psychiatry is, you know, many people who are incarcerated, there's an underlying brain issue. And, mm -hmm. you know, we need to help treat those underlying brain issues because getting to great brain health um, or, or treating mental health really starts with brain health. 
So how do we help people to really optimize their brain function? And how do we help to decrease stigma, right, around psychiatry and mental health issues so that, you know, inmates the help they need? Well, let's, so let's talk about the book then, because I think, you know, the book is all about that. And I think with the the more knowledge um, that, lay people have, um, and the more interest in the open conversations we're having around mental health. Yes. People want to know, you know, how can I, what can I do? What can I do to take care of my brain? I mean, who knew, you know, I wrote this book before the pandemic. It came out during the pandemic right now, mental health, mental health has been elevated, right? Everybody yeah. is aware of it. I feel like the stigma is now been decreased. It's okay to talk about anxiety, depression, traumas that you're experiencing, you know, with COVID and people have had long, long COVID, you know, they've got brain fog. So people are wanting to understand how do I, how do I deal with this, right? right. How, mm-hmm. what can I do at home? You know, the reason why I wrote Biohack Your Brain is because I had the good fortune of being the director of research for the Amen Clinics, which is a very large outpatient uh, psychiatric center. So it's nationally recognized. There's currently 10 locations in the United States. And the Amen Clinics is unique in that it uses brain imaging as a way to guide and target treatment for people with mental health issues. So the kind of people who would come into our clinic are people who have typically failed three previous treatment providers. So they've gone to different psychologists um, who haven't had the opportunity to actually look at the organic function of the brain. They haven't done EEGs or SPECT imaging or MRI. So they don't really know what's going on with the organic brain function. And so the kinds of people that come into our clinic, you know, had serious psychiatric challenges. They typically had three to four diagnoses and were on five to six medications. And, you know, over the course of time and being there, we helped uh, create a database, a brain imaging database, which currently has over 200,000 scans. So as their director of research running all of the clinical trials, one of our very first clinical trials um, was in professional football players. And we were asking the question, does playing football cause long-term brain damage? Um, This is back in 2009 when people weren't really talking about this the way they are now. I mean, CTE is very prominent um, within the media. So CTE is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is the neurodegenerative brain disease that is typically seen in individuals who are exposed to repetitive head impacts. So if you think about contact and, co- <laughs> contact and collision-based sports like football, the players are exposed to thousands of these repetitive impacts. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Excuse me as I'm talking. Oh, oh, mm. Take some of the green smoothie. Green juice, yeah. <laughs> green juice. Um, and over time, that's causing damage at the cellular level. And if we're not working to help um, mitigate the exposure to the repetitive impacts over time. And and we can't, so the issue is the players are exposed, right? To these thousands of impacts, it's causing shearing and tearing of the cells, right? At the cellular level. Okay, that's that's exactly what's happening because I wanted to say to you what, so when you get that hit, what exactly is happening to the brain? Yeah, so the hit is a biomechanical force to, it can be to the, to the head or to the body. So there's a, an energy, like a, a kinetic energy that goes through the body and the brain and the brain is sitting suspended in cerebrospinal fluid. So it's a three pound organ sitting suspended in cerebrospinal fluid encased within a skull. And when you take the impact, if it's, if it's hard enough, it can cause um, the biomechanical forces to sort of shear and tear the neurons. And it's if the impact goes straight to the head, that's a linear hit. Um, or, you know, if you get hit like in a, a boxing punch, how your head twists, that's a rotational shift. It's usually the rotational shifts that cause the shearing and tearing of the cells, literally the, the, the neurons. So it's 
If you've got a a single cell in the brain, it's called a neuron. It has these very long processes called axons that connect one cell to another. When you take those impacts, it tears the axon. Um, So over time, it's those repetitive impacts that can cause the degenerative brain disease we see called CTE. Um, The good news I will say in working with professional athletes. So what we did is run a clinical trial in a hundred of these professional football players. We did baseline brain imaging, did neurocognitive assessments, neuropsychiatric assessments, and then put them on a brain rehabilitation protocol and then had them come back six months later, a year later. So we followed them forward in time and asked the question. The first question was, does playing football cause long-term brain damage? And we pretty much found that in a hundred players, you know, we saw what's called diffuse global hypoperfusion, which means low blood flow throughout the brain. Mm -hmm. In many of these players, when we compared them to a healthy brain database, so we're taking pro athletes exposed to repetitive trauma, compare them to healthy individuals not exposed to repetitive trauma. And you see, you know, there was significant um, deficits deficits in blood flow. Why is that important? Well, blood flow is important to your brain, right? The blood carries oxygen and nutrients to the cells of your brain. So we want to make sure you have really good blood flow. So of course, in working with these athletes, we're not going to look at their images, show them the images and say, this is what your brain looks like. Good luck. We're you know, a clinic and we're going to help treat it. So we had a whole brain rehabilitation protocol, which I go into in the book, Biohack Your Brain. And we teach players how to take care of their brains through dietary and lifestyle modifications and then have them come back and get rescanned. And to my surprise, as a scientist, we do these follow-up scans and show there's improved perfusion. And not only is there improved perfusion, but it was sustained over time. So if we scan them six months later, then a year later, then two years later, we were able to maintain that improved blood flow. And that was through, again, dietary and lifestyle modifications. We actually have a whole bunch of things that we can do besides diet and lifestyle. We've got medications, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, transcranial magnetic stimulation, neurofeedback. There's so many modalities that we have available to help improve brain function. But for these athletes, I thought it was really extraordinary to see the recovery that was possible. Now, I have to make the caveat, we cannot undo brain damage, right? We cannot undo neurons that have been sheared or torn you know the the body has its own like restorative processes but you know i I always have to be very clear it's like we can't undo you know aggregation of tau and accumulation of those proteins that we start to see with cte but what we can do is help to restore blood flow to certain parts of the brain help to restore connectivity so neural connectivity so that people can have healthier emotional regulation. And that is what was so inspirational. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, what we started to do is not only teach it to our professional athletes, but I then started to teach these principles to people in our psychiatric setting. And I ran- And look at them also as a preventative way to, you know, show people- Yeah, that are typically healthy should be doing these certain things. To avoid. Absolutely. So the, one of the, sort of one of the most fascinating things that I've learned being a neuroscientist is that, you know, degenerative diseases we see start in the population around the age of 65. That's when you start to see people get diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairments, but the changes are happening at the cellular level 10 to 20 years before you have the symptoms. So what we've learned is that at the cellular level, you actually want to start taking care of your neurons. You want to start taking care of your brain at the cellular level. And how do you do that? You do that through adequate hydration every day. 
You do that through the consumption of berries, like, you know, have enough of these foods that are high in antioxidants. Antioxidants actually protect the cells of your brain from damage by free radicals. Free radicals poke holes in cell membranes. So it's these really simple principles. There's certain, you know, nutrients that you should have daily. And, you know, we can get into supplements. I get into it in the book. Um, one of the great things about being a brain imaging scientist is we have objective proof that you can take a nutritional supplement or follow a dietary and lifestyle protocol <clears throat> and see measurable objective changes in the brain. Wow. Wow. And, and to me, it takes the guesswork out of things. It, it takes, does this supplement really work or is this dietary and protocol I followed totally, really work? There's so much advice and there's so many of these um, programs, dietary supplements, you know, right? People, it's overwhelming to, it's, to it's, really understand it. It's <laughs> overwhelming. And I'll tell you, you know, one of the other positions I had besides being the director of research was the director of nutrition and nutraceuticals. So we would create nutraceutical formulations for our population, for, for psychi psychiatric population, and test them using the brain imaging. So we would test the efficacy of the different formulations to see, is this making a measurable difference in brain function? And we can do it using the neuroimaging combined with the neuropsychological um, assessments. And to me, that's really powerful when you can combine sort of both of those um, measurements mm. and to show a patient, if you take this nutritional supplement, um, here's your brain imaging before, here's your brain imaging after, what it does is it increases compliance and it also gives them a sense of agency that what they're doing is actually making a measurable difference in their brain function. And I feel Again, that's why I wrote the book. I felt like, you know, we've had thousands of patients come through our clinic. You know, all of the strategies in the book are what we use in the clinical setting and they're very effective. And I wanted people to have what I would call the blueprint of what they could do daily at home to help support the health and longevity of their brain. And I also wrote the book specifically for people who also struggle with brain injuries and think there is help, there is hope, your brain can change. I've seen it. I've seen it in people who are 80 years old. Like we scan people who are in their 80s or 90s. I've seen it with people who've had dementia, who've come in, they have the diagnosis, but we can still help bring perfusion back to their brain. And that's really empowering for people. I mean, there's certain things we certainly, you know, we still can't cure um, Alzheimer's disease, but we could slow it down. Can I ask you a question about mm -hmm. what I hear? I um, I talk about Alzheimer's on the show because it's mm -hmm. so prevalent in my family. And mm -hmm. they talk about the plaque in the brain all the time with you know, right. associated with that. Right. So is there anything that you've discovered um, can be helpful in avoiding that buildup of plaque in the brain that, that we can do? Well, yeah, I mean, that's where the dietary and lifestyle modifications are really important. As long as you don't have a genetic cause for the Alzheimer's disease. So there are certain genes um, that are causative and there's not as much as, that you can do with that. But 90% of Alzheimer's cases um, can be slowed down by proper uh, dietary and lifestyle modifications. You know, we talk about... Um, the Mediterranean diet or the mind diet. So the mind is this combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet to stop hypertension. Um, that, that dietary protocol is one that has been shown not only to help um, reverse cardiovascular disease, but also slow down neurodegenerative decline. Um, they've studied it at Rush University, and they found that people who adhered to this dietary protocol, um, even moderately, were able to slow the progression of Alzheimer's by 35%. Those that followed it rigorously were able to slow um, 
the progression of Alzheimer's by 53%. And this is just that significant dietary protocol. Mm -hmm. Now, this that particular study um, was done over the time period of 14 years. They looked at people, I believe it was from age 60 to maybe mid 80s. And I believe the follow up was at least a minimum of four to five years. So you had to be on the dietary protocol for a number of years, which takes commitment and dedication. But if you know that Alzheimer's runs in your family and you mm-hmm. want to be proactive, you know, about slowing it down, you would do this protocol. The other thing, there was a wonderful um, neuroimaging study that was published. They, I want to say it was by researchers uh, at Cornell University and NYU. Um, they did brain imaging of individuals they were, I believe they were age 30 to 60 in age. So younger, um, they were either on a Mediterranean diet or they were not on a Mediterranean diet. They did imaging at baseline and I believe imaging a year later, and they looked for the Alzheimer's plaques that you were talking about. And those who adhered to, um, this was, I believe the Mediterranean diet because it came out before the mind diet, uh, were found to have lower plaque burden as measured by um, amyloid PET scanning. So we do know diet matters. Yes. We know that. I mean, look, every single thing that you put in your mouth, you know, at the clinic, we always say, is this good for your brain? Is this bad for your brain? It's very simple. And, you know, in the clinical setting, I was teaching um, brain health classes for weight loss, was actually inspiring people to take care of their brain health with the great side effect of being yes. weight loss and and it worked it was extraordinary so again the book is all of the principles you know that i have taught you know all the patients who've come through in the clinical setting and our athletes i wanted to let people know that your brain has this thing called neuroplasticity right so it can always change you can always continue to strengthen the synaptic connections between neurons. Um, And there are certain regions of the brain that continue to grow throughout the lifespan, most importantly in the hippocampus, the area of the brain essential to learning and memory. So, you know, I wanted people to never lose hope, no matter what you are struggling with. You know, my father had Parkinson's disease, you know, my grandmother in her 90s had Alzheimer's. I've worked with plenty of people who've had psychiatric you know, issues of all kinds and have had degenerative, different degenerative diseases. And we have seen that people can still get better no matter where their brain is at, no matter what issue they're struggling with. And to me, that is so empowering. And it is. I, I, ha- I had to put this book out into the world, even if it was just for parents who had children that played collision-based sports, wanting to know that they could still be proactive in supporting their kids' brains and they didn't have to be afraid of things like CTE. Yeah, it's it's just, it gives people hope. Um, gosh, it, wouldn't it be amazing? You know, this is where, you know, the financials are an issue, but if we, as our yearly exam, everyone could have an, a scan of their brain and see where they are, that would be so incredible, but I don't see that ever happening. You know, it depends on what kind of scan it is. So I do um, brain imaging called quantitative EEG, where we can take a look at the electrical activity of the brain. And that's relatively inexpensive. You're not exposed to radio pharmaceuticals like you might be with some of the more advanced imaging. And I think it can give a nice snapshot into what your brain looks like because we can compare it to a normative database. And you know, just see how you're doing. And I think that is accessible to more people than they think, you know, those can run anywhere from five to $600, which I feel like is, is, yeah, I would have thought that's an accessible price point versus some of the more sophisticated imaging technologies that, you know, truth be told, we might use more for people who have degenerative diseases, right? Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, you know, DAT scan for Parkinson's, amyloid PET, um, MRI, if we need to look at brain volume. Um, but I think more for mental health issues or even for optimizing brain health, you know, a quantitative EEG could be done, 
you know, I don't know on an annual basis, but it could be done. Really, I like it for people who struggle with mental health issues because we can right. we can sort of pinpoint how your unique brain is wired and then use that either for targeted um, nutraceutical treatments. So we can see what kind of supplements that we could use to help support that um, targeted neurofeedback, which will work with the very specific um brain map that you have to help bring it back into balance so your brain is more efficient and uh we can also use medications so yeah it's just it's a way a combination always of multiple things there's no quick fix right and and we always say you need to pair the brain imaging with the clinical symptoms right that's really important you know you can never just diagnose somebody off of a brain image you have to look at the whole picture mm -hmm. but i feel that you know we're entering a time when more people are going to do that you see people with the wearable technologies yes you know people are already you know they've got the muse and they put the little things on their forehead My and four year old mother in law has the apple watch so that yeah, she can that's what i pay attention to what's going on but that i love that because that gives her a sense of agency that allows her to track the metrics i think the more that we're getting into the, the wearables and the tracking is really helping people to take, get better control of their health. And I feel like that's going to extend our health span and our lifespan. Yeah. So all of this is good news. <laughs> it is. It is. And I'm sorry to say we're out of time. I oh, didn't no. Get we're, we're out of time already? My questions. <laughs> I'll have to have you back. Part two? Uh, yes, part okay, two. Good. Yeah, I enjoyed it so much. And, you know, I think it's not just really about the work that you're doing, but it really is about who you are and how you present the work so that people can um, understand it, right? And and really implement some of this stuff into their own lives. So, okay, the question is do you understand it? Uh, some of most of okay, it. Okay, good. Okay, good. Yeah. That makes me happy. Exactly. The way you're describing it and explaining it, sometimes doctors, scientists, their, their intellect is so much higher. It's hard to follow, but I it's, appreciate how you talk about it. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I try my best to bridge the science, right? So that everybody can get a good understanding. I mean, at the end of the day, we all have brains. They're beautiful. You know, yeah. they're malleable. They can, you know, continue to grow. And, and I think one of the the best things to leave people with is, you know, we always say you are not stuck with the brain you have. We can make it better. You can make it better. You can optimize it. There's so many things you can do. So, you know, feel free to reach out if you have any questions or if people have any questions with me, like I'm always happy to help and provide support and education where I can. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Kristen, for taking the time. We're going to go into um, our last break. You'll hear okay. from our watch team, and I'll be back. Action News, celebrating 50 years with AccuWeather. If you think severe weather has been on the rise, you are correct. In the last three years, tornado warnings in our region have shattered records. With 52 last year alone, half of those warnings resulted in confirmed tornadoes, including two extremely rare EF3s. Thanks for always trusting us to keep you informed. 50 Years of AccuWeather is sponsored by Independence Blue Cross. Choose coverage you can count on with the region's strongest network. Is the best vacation one that you find? or one you get lost in, one that takes you to new heights or reminds you to go with the flow, to get your feet wet and your wheels spinning, one that lets you find your own rhythm or get carried away. Find the best of yourself. Get lost in the woods. Plan your stay in the wild woods today. From Philadelphia to the Lehigh Valley, and everywhere in between. For 150 years, Penn Community Bank has been a part of your neighborhood. Helping businesses start, supporting families as they grow, and staying connected to the people and places that make this region special. It's who we are and where we're from. Penn Community Bank, here we are and here we grow. There's a moment. Every hour, every day, every week. These moments shape our world. They add color, perspective, and sometimes pain. Moments are meant to be shared. Shared by friends, family, people you trust. 
At Action News, we cherish every moment, and it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world. Never miss a moment. Trust the people at Action News. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Thanks so much for joining me this week. Um, I was very happy to be able to share Dr. Kristen Willemeyer's story with you. She does some fascinating work, and I encourage you to get her book, Biohack Your Brain. Um, Next week, I'm going to be talking to Stacey Icke, and she is a TV and podcast host um, doing some incredible work and, and just really at the beginning of her career. Thanks so much to our watch team members and sponsors and Kateri. Always doing a great job. Have a great week, everyone. Hi, this is Sue Rocco. Women to Watch is pleased to share a clip from Breaking Through, a podcast hosted by Madeline Bell, the president and CEO of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This interview is part of a series in which Madeline interviews CHOPs women scientists about what inspires them and advice they have for other women interested in pursuing science and medicine careers. My guest today is Dr. Marnie Falk. Dr. Falk is a geneticist who specializes in caring for children with mitochondrial disease. So let's start with you describing what is mitochondrial disease and how does it impact children? Absolutely. It's very hard to look at somebody and know that their mitochondria aren't working. I give the analogy to my patients of a doll. If somebody brought you a toy doll and the doll's arm wasn't connected, you would know there was a trauma. There was something obviously wrong. But if somebody brought you that doll, let's say a child, and the doll wasn't walking and it wasn't talking and it wasn't blinking and the lights weren't going on, most parents would try to change the batteries. Well, that's what we think of as mitochondrial disease. The batteries aren't working properly. So things like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, even aging. When we age, our mitochondrial DNA integrity becomes impaired. We get deletions in it and we get less mitochondria. And you know this because if you're at a party with grandkids and little kids, who's the ones running around? (laughs) It's the little kids because their energy is just so much higher because our ability to make energy goes down unless we exercise. That really helps us. (laughs) So we're still learning all the different areas where mitochondrial dysfunction is happening. We're now recognizing it's probably much more than even one in 4,300. It's probably many more of us (laughs) than we'd like to admit. To hear more of Madeline's interviews with CHOP's amazing doctors and scientists, listen to Breaking Through with Madeline Bell, available wherever you get your podcasts. Action News, celebrating 50 years with AccuWeather. If you think severe weather has been on the rise, you are correct. In the last three years, tornado warnings in our region have shattered records. With 52 last year alone, half of those warnings resulted in confirmed tornadoes, including two extremely rare EF3s. Thanks for always trusting us to keep you informed. 50 Years of AccuWeather is sponsored by Independence Blue Cross. Choose coverage you can count on with the region's strongest network. Now, the women to watch, military watch. Fewer than half of eligible veterans use the VA health benefits they are entitled to. But those who do use the VA, more than 80% of veterans are satisfied with the VA care. Hi, I'm Carol Eggert, Senior Vice President of Military Affairs at Comcast NBC Universal. Now, you may be asking, why should this matter to me? I share this with you because most of our listeners have some connection to the veterans in their community and may have the opportunity to share information about this new VA benefit. The VA has just launched the PACT Act, which is the Promise to Address Comprehensive Toxics, which is the most significant expansion of veteran benefits and care in more than three decades empowering the VA to help millions of toxic exposed veterans and their survivors. The PACT Act expands VA health care and benefits for veterans exposed to burn pits, Agent Orange, and many other toxic substances. 
The PACT Act adds to the list of health conditions that the VA presumes are caused by exposure to these substances. This law helps the VA provide generations of veterans and their survivors with the care and benefits they've earned and deserve. The PACT Act is the least we can do for the countless men and women who suffered toxic exposure while serving their country, said President Biden during the PACT Act bill signing ceremony. It means access to life insurance, home loan insurance, tuition benefits, and help with health care. So what can you do? Simply refer those veterans you know to va.gov and tell them to search the PACT Act to learn more.